is that record? Um, welcome everyone for this class. Um, um, I hope you're all okay and keeping safe. I saw Susan's message on the group about uh, people passing. I hope you're all safe. Um, today I also received news that uh, one of our former students, a student I actually supervised first on, he, he did um, IT with Umu. He was uh, also did his master's in ICT as well. He was doing a master's in public health again with Umu and he passed on, I think today. So I'm sure everyone knows somebody somewhere who has passed on. So condolences to anyone who has lost and those who are not well, we wish you quick recovery and everybody keeps safe. So um, I had put up two videos <coughs> briefly explaining research methods. Um, I have seen one person with a question. I hope they are okay. I'm, this is one of the, I'm not very good with making pre-recorded videos. We are all learning how to do this. Um, I saw one, one uh, comment from Dan about uh, explaining some things, uh, especially the principle to controlling error, internal error um, in uh, quantitative research. Um, Dan, one, one of the things I'm going to do, I found a small article that gives detailed explanation, but I'm also going to try and give some explanation and uh, anyone else who has experience, especially equipment, you have quite a good, good experience in, in quantitative research, you can chip in. Eh? So if anyone has a question, uh, let, I'm just going to share uh, the screen to show uh, Dan's question. So he says, uh, kindly explain more on the Max Mikon principle, especially. Um, so I'm going to pick out one, uh, which is systematic variance. Um, and just give a, just a bit more explanation on it. Eh? <coughs> so I hope you, I hope you can all hear me. Yes, doctor. Okay. So I'm just going to speak, pick up on the first one. And maybe others can give a bit more explanation to it. So um, let us begin with the, let us just begin with a simple example. It's going to be attached to an article that I'm going to put up. Um, imagine, let us imagine there is an alien race because this is the, the example that the article gives. Eh? Let us imagine there's an alien race. Uh, if anyone has watched uh, Star Wars, um, there, there was an, an alien race called the Vulcans. Eh? So imagine an, an, a researcher is, doing, is, is, tr is trying to determine who has which race between humans and Vulcans, which of these races is, is more is is more intelligent now one we need to determine uh intelligence in each group okay the, the, there's there's one that you realize there are two separate groups there's the vulcans and the humans or let's even bring it further let's bring it to maybe men and women let's bring it even closer to to, to, to genders within, within our human race, men and women. Now, when we realize, when we look at men and women, it's, it's still quite a large group. If we're talking about men and women, you have different types of groups. You have, uh, the, you have the educated, you have the, uh, the, the literates and the non-literates, those who have gone to school, those who have, no, who have not gone to school. Um, you have people who, can, who are coming from different social backgrounds. Okay, let's us bring narrow it down further. You may have people who come from um, different professions, whatever it is. 
let us say we have narrowed down to a specific group. Let us say um, lawyers. Let us speak of a highly intelligent group, lawyers. And we have male lawyers, some male lawyers and some female lawyers of a certain age group. We, we select these groups and then we carry out an IQ test. Now, the first thing we want to note is that if we do an IQ test among this particular male group of lawyers, we need first of all to know that the average, the average uh, in IQ test among them should be as close as possible. If it's wide apart, it means uh, these groups have varying numbers. For example, uh, if you have some who are at 60 and others who are at maybe 100, that's quite a huge number. But if majority are between 90 and 100, which means that the, the average among them, most of them are within the same group. Let's say that those are the men. Then let's come to the women. The same, we also do carry out the same test. And then we find, let me not be biased because I'm female. Let me assume that, uh, let's assume that the men, their average is maybe uh, 95. And then for the women, their average is, let us say, 90 or even less, maybe 80. Then we can say that predominantly we have smarter or more intelligent male lawyers than women. Yeah, we have that, that kind of control. So far, are we together, Dan and everyone, up to that point? Yes, doctor. Yes. Then <clears throat> we can go further and say, okay, we have tested a group of male lawyers who probably studied within the same time. Let us expand it further to a group of lawyers, um, maybe who have studied in, 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 the, in the age of ICT, where they, 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 we, we can say that, con that group we looked at was of, of maybe of a class which studied before ICT, before there was collaboration with uh, others, maybe from other countries. Let us get another control group, okay? We get another control group and also carry out the same test. If we carry out the same test and it still comes out that that variance is higher, we, it's up still among the men, then we can still then say it is it, it, the male, male, male lawyers are smarter. But if it comes out, there's, there's a change now. They are now closer together. We can then say it's it's we can then say no, it, it's not necessarily because they are men, but maybe there is now um the, there is more ICT contact. Or if we see an increase when when we have seen a greater support for women in the education sector and we are seeing the intelligence levels of female lawyers going up, it means an, uh, probably uh, uh, something um that, that pr probably there is now an intervening variable that is causing this, that is incre increasing intelligence levels among female lawyers. So essentially what we're saying in an experimental research or even in another non-experimental, when you try to test all possible conditions, what you're doing is essentially minimizing systematic variance. When you test all possible conditions, whether in an experiment or non-experiment, you are reducing, you are basically eliminating, trying to um, pinpoint all, all possible areas that may affect intelligence. So far, are we together? Very clear, doctor. 
Okay. Maybe we could hear yes. from Trippen because he's also quite knowledgeable in, in quantitative research. I'm not an expert on it. Uh, yes, please, doctor. Yes, um, uh, I was wondering if you could also, can also throw in something. Yes, I could, mm. but um, the terms uh, the terms used could be different from exact the practical world that okay. I am um, um, that I that I know. Okay. Maybe not getting exact uh, words. Mm. Need, um, okay. Okay. Um, so here. Uh, this is Moses. Um, just giving uh, some small practical example. Yes. Um, here in Imbari, in the institution I work with, there is a, a randomized trial we are trying to cut out. Yes. So this trial. We are, we are trying to determine um, the level of substance when mothers give birth. So what we did, we have um, what we call the control and the intervention groups. Excuse Moses. We give some and Excuse me, Moses. You're breaking. We can't we hear you. Give them the normal water and so. So we call it a randomization. Reason being, we don't. Uh, Moses, we lost you. Okay. Um, let's just uh, come back to... to um, questions uh, that, that Dan pushed forward. So the second one was uh, minimizing error variance. And I think here Crippen gave us um, some really good, uh, I remember, explanation. So here we are basically looking at the instruments we use to collect data and taking them through uh, tests, several tests, section, several um, steps, of pre, sorry, pre-tests or testing before we actually submit them to, um, or rather administer them to our respondents. The objective of ensuring that your instrument of data collection um, has minimal or no errors is to ensure that you correct accurate data or data that you actually intend to collect. And Crippen gave us several examples where he said, for example, that you would first of all give it to um, an expert. You, you've designed your instrument, which would be a question, for example, a questionnaire. You give it to an expert um, who, would, who would examine the content. Um, your questions, are, are they right questions? Are they questions that are 
that will give you that right response or the response that you need to answer your research question, research hypothesis to help you prove or disprove your research hypothesis. The second would be taking it, giving it to a group of, of respondents. Uh, that this would be respondents who would, uh, people who would meet the criteria for the, the, the real respondents that you'd use. And the, these people then give you feedback on, on your questionnaire. If it, makes, if it makes sense to them or not, or if it gives you the results that you need to know. Take an example. If you, if you created a scale where you are asking um, your respondents how they felt about something, maybe an artifact, and you give a scale, um, you, you, you give a scale, uh, the highest being five, the lowest being zero. Or, or where you have something like um, a strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. And then you find out that the neutral, later on you realize the neutral is actually irrelevant. It doesn't help you prove or disprove anything. If, if, you, if you went and tested it and you, you found that if somebody being neutral about something is actually of, of no consequence to your research. Now, by pre-testing, you, you find that you can actually remove that component from your questionnaire. So what you're doing when you carry out these tests, you are minimizing error variance. So far, uh, is, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes some sense, but still, it's still confusing a bit. Okay. Um, what, what part is confusing? Maybe Kripen can also um, chip in here. <clears throat> yes, yes, done. Yes, creeping. Now, what happens once you 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 are given an assignment? I'm going to carry out a research, probably on uh, adoption of ICT. You sit down, and 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 before even you start designing, you identify in adoption what, what is included in adoption you have like four or five indicators of adoption. Meaning these are like your objectives. Now, once you have these, it means your questionnaires will be based on these indicators or on these objectives. Now you design a questionnaire. A normal questionnaire normally starts with a, a, a cross-ended questionnaire Normally it starts with the introduction. You introduce yourself. I'm a student of this and my name is this and this. I'm carrying out a study on adoption in, for example, in, in, in Umu. Um, this, work, this research is best uh, is for academic purposes and continue and, and go on. From there, it has the background. Then you say, what is the age? What is the sex? What um, the, the areas of expertise, how long have you interacted with people in IT, the background. Now, from the background, you go to the objectives. However, not, not all questions in the background must have age, weight, or height, or duration, or type of the contract. It depends on the kind of work you are doing. Now, when you go on the objectives, there is what we call a Ricate scale. A Ricate scale is what the doctor was explaining. From, a, from the highest, a five would be indicated as strongly agree. A four, agree. A three, people who are neutral or who are not sure. 
Then a two, people who disagree. Now, a one, people who strongly disagree. It's always good that you start with the highest and up to the lowest. You design your questionnaires. Now, assume you have 40 questions that you have designed. Then in front of those questions, you have put a section for ticking in, <clears throat> in those boxes. If it is a strongly agree, you tick in. If it's a, a, a disagree, you tick in. Now, after designing this questionnaire, you as Mr. Dan, you cannot be sure that this questionnaire is right or wrong. You cannot even be sure the questions you have asked if they are right. Now, what happens? You get this questionnaire. You take it to another person. It could be a profession in that field. It could be a supervisor. It can be discussed as a group. Now, when they are testing validity, you are not going to answer questions in the, uh, you're not going to fill the questionnaire with strongly agree or disagree. You are looking at the content. If I from the question and said, I strong, I believe uh, studying ICT increases your chances of adopting ICT. Now, in validity, they are, you look at that particular question. Is it the right English? Is this question relevant to the objective of what I'm asking, my objective? Is, are my questions flowing very well? Remember, you have 40 questions. You have given one questionnaire to a doctor. You have given another questionnaire to a professional in that particular field. You have given another questionnaire to a group. That means we have three questionnaires which are in the field, which are being examined. Now, doctor will say out of the 40 questions, only 38 are correct. Now, in validity, we have what we call content validity index. That's why content, the content of that particular questionnaire. Now, out of the 40 questions, it would be 38 out of 40. Content validity index has a formula. It's small n over big n. A small n means it keeps on changing. The big N, it means it's a constant. Meaning, doctor will say out of 40, 38 are correct, which means 38 will be a small N, which is going to be 38 out of 40. Now, you take it to another profession in the field. That profession is going to say out of the 40 question, 35 are correct, which means 35 divided by, by 40 you find you have uh, 0 0.87. Doctor had said it is 38, so it's going to be 38 divided divide by 40. You have 0 0.95. Now, another person, if it was a group discussion, if they, we had subjected your question to a group, now a group says, no, the correct questions, they are, 30. So it's going to be 30 out of 40, which will give you uh, 0 0.75. Now, remember they are looking at the wording, the, the tensing and, and the grammar of this questionnaire. They will return to you these questionnaires. Now, you look at the first person, which was 0 0.79, 0 0.87, 0 0.75. You add them now, 0 0.95. You find you are getting uh, a 2.55. So it's mean it's going to be 2.55 divided by three. And you find you have 0 0.85. Now, in validity, because you are using a scale, different authors, they have, it, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's a, like a, a, a standard value. 
it is 0 0.75, 0 0.7. Now, if you do your validity index and define it is above 0 0.7, it means your questionnaire has passed. However, you go back and correct your tense, your English, your grammar, you ask the right questions. It has passed that stage. Now, if it is, that's what I was saying. If it is, uh, for example, if you apply uh, and an NGO is, is carrying out work and they want somebody who's going to carry out research and you have tested validity, you take your, you take your questionnaire to the people who gave you work and they sign on it. So that the questions you ask in the field, they are the real questions. Because you may go in the field and you get results, people will reject your results. Now, if it's for academic, it means you have passed the validity test, a pre-testing. Like I said last time, if my area of study is Kawembe, I will go to Bwaise. Or if my area of study is, for example, uh, Minister of Trade, I can easily go to another ministry, like a minister, uh, another ministry, because the ministries are somehow related. For example, I can go to uh, like, like Minister of Finance, and I will subject my questions to people of IT. Now, when you are doing a pre-testing, you don't really do a lot of questions. You give them like 20 or 15. You bring them back. This time, you are testing reliability. These people are going to take the other side where you had put the boxes. If depending on the statistical package you are using, if it is SPSS, you enter your questions in SPSS. They are, they are, here I'm not talking about removing errors in, in, in your work, removing what? We are only concentrating on pretesting. You run what we call a reliability test. There are different tests you can do. There is a Spearman test. There is a Gitterman. Uh, I've forgotten the third one. There are like four tests that you can cut out. Now, once you cut out, uh, sorry, Cron batch, Cron batch, there is what we call Cron batch alpha. You cut out a Cron batch test. It is just in SPSS. You click reliability, then you select your questions. They are all entered into SPSS. You click the test you want to run. If it is a Cron batch alpha, it will give you some values in a box. It will show you the number of questions you have entered. It will, also, it will also show you the value. If the value is above 0 0.72, it means people have understood your questionnaire. So it has, it has passed a reliability test. <laughs> Remember, the importance of a reliability. Can I rely on my results that I've picked in Minister of Finance? Can they be used in the Ministry of Trade? Can they be used in, in, in foreign affairs? Can they be used in internal affairs? Now, once you finish that, it means your questionnaire is good enough to go in the field and correct the data. Now, this time you take your questionnaire and take it to your case study. Then you pick the information. That's exactly what happens. Thank you. Thank you, Kripen. Yes, Moses. Um, Thank you so much, Kripen. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear yes, you. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, Moses. 
I have the internet challenge, but let me switch. There's a question I have for for Quipen. Let me first switch. Seems Zimbabwe is poor now. Okay, Kripen, thank you so much uh, for that. Um, I think the third the third section we on um, on uh, error reduction was controlling variance of confounding slash nuance variables. So the first thing that was that uh, the slide was talking about what exactly are um, nuance or confounding variables. So one, you may be doing research, but you may have uh, variables that may not be of primary interest to the researcher. But these variables can cause undesirable, undesirable variation in your study or misleading uh, results. What do we mean? Now, you have to remember that uh, quantitative research is highly controlled, highly, highly controlled. Unlike qualitative research, where we look at the, the entire picture, that, the total picture, the totality of it all, eh? where we want to measure truly something that the, the, a certain variable, a certain aspect, a certain phenomena, we want to, to measure it. But certain things will automatically may cause an effect. Let me give an example. I am, um, if we're looking, let's say, at, uh, at uh, medication uh, in, in terms of, of, of fighting a certain disease or, or curing or whatever it is, if I'm taking malaria medication, the, the, the malaria medication is designed to treat the malaria virus, okay? And the intention is to see that the malaria medication actually treats the malaria infection or virus. But, but, but I am taking, um, maybe at the same time, I am not taking, or I'm not uh, eating right the way I should as somebody who who is sick, maybe I'm not drinking enough water, I'm not eating, or I may not, I may not be eating enough food, or I don't have uh, food available. Um, as I'm treating malaria, I'm, I'm still, I'm not sleeping under a mosquito net. All these things will not give me the desirable end result. Yeah, all these things will not give me the desirable end result of actually treating the malaria itself. For me to be able to get the result of treating malaria, all these other conditions must be right. I should be eating right. I should be, um, I, I, I should be sleeping under a mosquito net and so on and so forth. Look at, think of it in all other aspects, even for example, when you're treating HIV and so on and so forth. Now, if you're carrying out research, if you're carrying out research, and um, let us say you are uh, trying to collect data on uh, uh, maybe on certain government work from certain government workers, um, let us say in the field of healthcare, and you give them a questionnaire. In normal circumstances, these health workers should give you appropriate answers. But let us say you submit this questionnaire at a time when these people have been transferred. They've done a government reshuffle. As we know all government jobs, what will happen? The response you get will affect your results. Maybe this person is not happy. The person has been transferred from Kampala, uh, maybe all the way to Karamoja, and they are not happy that this transfer has done, has happened. What will, what will be the result? They will give you a response based on their feeling at the time. 
okay? So what will happen is that these people, this person will contaminate or distort the true relationship between the independent and dependent variables. Does that make any sense? Yes. Okay. Do we have any other contribution to this? I'm, I'm waiting for Moses to... Okay. Hey, I don't know whether my internet is now okay. Okay. Uh, mine was a... Uh, was just a question. I don't know whether it is to Crippen or Professor. And the kind of research we are going to do at the end of our academic study, is it, what I wanted is some kind of clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, is it survey based or I can just sit at my place, think of a system or an application and they start developing it. So, sorry, Moses, could you please repeat that? Just repeat the question. The kind of research we are supposed to do at the end of our academic study. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of a survey based or this kind of research where I can sit at my place, mm -hmm. uh, think of a system, develop it without going to the field. Mm -hmm. And that is the end of the story. Okay, okay. Moses, thank you. That is a, a really good question. Dan, do you have also a question? I'd like to respond, to, but uh, I can maybe respond to both. Do you have a question, Dan, do you want to add on? Uh, I just wanted maybe to add on or, or to, to give some guidance whether, I don't know whether my opinion is okay to Moses's question, as if Moses, what is, what Moses is talking about is maybe using the secondary data and then you come up with a system. I don't know whether that's what he's trying to mean. Hello. Yes, Ronald. Yeah, um, this is Kiza, Ronald. I, I think what Moses was meaning was um, the, 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 those especially projects is meaning a project where you sit down and think of uh, maybe an application that is going to solve a certain problem and then you do that as your project it's most cases a project not research okay okay ronald ronald thank you uh thank you for for that uh, that comment now um I'm going to try and, uh, and, and give some guidance on, on this subject. Uh, but of course, I will also need clarity from my, from my department on what is expected. But let me first give guidance in terms of research as a whole. Now, you will notice that I gave you two research design perspectives. One was from a qualitative perspective. The other was from a quantitative perspective. If, if we're doing research, um, Ronald gave a nice uh, analogy where he said what, that what Moses is talking about is a project and then there's research. So let me first start that we, we first have two perspectives, okay? We have a quantitative perspective and qualitative perspective. Whatever research you're doing, whether it is as we are in ICT or IS or wherever else we may be, all research will fall under any of these two approaches, either qualitative or quantitative. Now, let us, let us bring it down to um, our fields of ICT and IS. Let us say, um, I'm in the Moses' shoes. I, I, I want to... Um, <coughs> design an application, a system. The first thing, and I want to bring this into a research perspective, not a project perspective, a research perspective. I want to design a system, but in terms of research. 
So I want to design a system. The first question would be, why am I designing this system? What problem, what problem have I observed? Let me even put this further into research. What research problem have I observed? I may have first observed this in my organization. I may have observed this in, in, a, in a certain context, maybe in healthcare, in business, um, in, in, the, in the education sector, the, whichever sector it is, whichever institution in healthcare, in education, in government, whatever it is, there is a certain problem that exists. And by the time I'm designing this system, translate that to the word artifact, I have observed something. So I go ahead and design this artifact. Separate, maybe I go ahead and read, I design it. If I want to to translate this from a project to a research, I bring this artifact slash system slash application, whatever it is, put it in a certain context, and then I evaluate it. I don't know if my speech is, is, is graphic enough to, to, to grasp what I'm trying to say. Yes. Yeah. So what you would be doing is designing that artifact, let's say it's a system, it's an application. It could even be a, for ICT students, there are some who say, I want to design a model, I want to design a, a framework, whatever it is. I'm designing it separate from a certain context. Then after I finish designing it, if I want to make it into a research, I place it into a certain context and evaluate it. What I report back is what I have evaluated, my results from the evaluation. Now here, here borrowing, you'd be going to the research method design science. And more or less, you'd be using it, it again. It could be you, you, you could use, um, you could have used results from a survey, some survey research done by someone else, and you decided to build your system based on that. You could be using a literature review, basing on that, and then you go ahead and design. So, either way, you are doing research. So it, it isn't that ICT people, IT people, IS people cannot do research. No, you, you would do, you, you are also doing research. You, you have an artifact you have designed and you place it into a context. That is using design science. You can also use the other way where your artifact emerges from the context. Previously, you, the, in, the past, in the past scenario, your artifact, which is the IS system, is coming from is coming from um, generic information, some literature review or something else. Apart from the context, and you're placing it in a context. The other perspective is you can design an artifact coming from a certain context. Maybe you choose an organization, a certain sector, you design it, and then you, as you're designing it, you're evaluating. The results of your evaluation is what you report back. Okay. Actually, okay. the reason why I asked. Yes, please. Uh, where I work from, the, the project we are currently, the research project we are currently running, mm -hmm. it has, uh, master's students who are okay. part of the project okay. and then PhD. Mm -hmm. So it is a general project, but all of these categories get their sub research components mm -hmm. from that general project. Okay. 
Okay. So this is the reason why I was, I, I wanted to find my, whether I can fix myself inside the same project. Yes, you can. And actually live project is, is a very good area to begin, eh? a, a really good area to begin. Okay. Hmm. So did we have any question on the qualitative side? The quantitative side is quite technical. Did we have any question on the qualitative side? I can just pull up some of those slides. Just some of those slides, maybe on, um, we can look at uh, the sampling strategies. We have any question on the qualitative side? Yes, uh, doctor. Yes, please. Specifically on this slide you presented, uh, snowballing sampling from your explanation. Mm. I, I, I felt like it's a bit of someone going too deep. And I'm wondering at the level of the research we need to present for academic study, is it worth taking some risks, like getting involved in some cartels to <laughs> unveil, disclose uh, thank, thank you for that yes, question. Yeah, th thank you for that question. Um, yeah, for sure, it's, I, I mean, for at, at master's level, when you're trying to get, your, you're looking at getting an academic, um, some kind of, a, uh, your academic papers, this is a bit much, but of course my objective is to try and and introduce all possible areas, eh? all possible areas for you to, for, so because your studying doesn't end here. It basically, it basically doesn't end here, but it, it goes even further. So um, yeah, it, it really depends. Eh? It, it, <coughs> um, you, uh, for you now, you'll probably be looking at something like a typical, a typical case sampling or um, intensity sampling where you, you know you're going to get a lot of information, a lot more information in a particular a case study than in, more than in another, something like that. For example, if if you went, if you are if you are trying to understand um, how certain students are feel about e-learning, the e-learning their e-learning experience, you may be better off going to a university which is actually more involved in e-learning more than others. Take an example, universities, public universities have barely had much e-learning. One, because some lecturers have refused to teach, to teach online. Two, because some students have completely rejected. So you, you may find that is not an information rich case where you may get a full experience. You may decide to go for a private university where uh, the majority of the students have actually picked up using um, e-learning uh, platforms. So that, that, that may, so here you're looking at in, an information rich case or a typical case where people are using uh, e-learning. If you are looking at um, um, if you, you want to look at uh, typical cases, again, like for example, uh, if, you, if you wanted to look at uh, a rural healthcare setting and you, you decide to choose a, an area where you have limited rural populations, for example, like Kampala or Wakiso, places like that, you, you may not uh, have a, a, a clear, a, 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 so, sorry, a typical rural healthcare setting 
or if you're looking at rural schools, you may need to go to a typical rural area as opposed to going to an area which is closer to the urban areas. Maybe you go to the area, areas like Budo, which are closer to Kampala and may not exhibit um, characteristics that are actually rural in nature. So the, the areas which I would say, the kind of sampling strategies you may use, you may use are uh, intensity sample, sampling, typical, case sampling or theory-based sampling. This is where cases are selected based on a, a certain theoretic, uh, uh, theoretical construct. T take an example, if we are looking at adoption and we say adoption of ICT, and we say then we look at adoption uh, theories like TAM or there are other theories, that TAM is the only one which comes straight off to head. And you say, I'm going to, I, if, the, 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 what term proposes, I need to look for a case that best represents term or any other theory for that matter. So th those would be the examples I would give you. Thank you. Any other question? Do we have any other question regarding this? No? No. 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 Okay, okay. Um, it's uh, I, the next topic, if we start it now, we may not cover it quickly. We want to look, I wanted us to look at research problems because uh, a, a research problem leads to research design. So um, I was thinking, let us start this tomorrow morning at nine, we look at research problems and specifically look at uh, the difference bet between uh, research, uh, qu qualitative research questions versus hypothesis in quantitative research. Is the, would, you, would you accept that recommendation? Would we start that topic tomorrow morning? I entirely yes, agree with you. Okay. 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 So let us start on that topic okay. tomorrow at nine. I think nine o'clock is the agreed time. Eh? Yes, doctor. Okay, so thank you. Have a good night. Let me let you go to rest. I'm sure most of you are tired. Um, let me let you off to rest. Yeah? Thank you so much. For okay, thank you. Good night. Good night.